Hello and welcome to another Piper Pearl. Today's Pearl, we're going to be looking at the throat examination, which to be fair includes an examination of the oral cavity. So just getting started and describing a few things you're going to need before you get ready. As with all objective and physical examinations, you really need a subjective reason to do the oral exam. So by that, it can be as simple as somebody saying they have a sore throat, somebody indicating a reason to have a look. We try to fall in the habit of doing physical investigations with purpose. So we only ever do physical investigations on the patient if there is a reason or if there is a pertinent negative, which means something you need to have a look at because of statistical probability, protocol, even though we believe it's probably going to be negative. Before we have a look in the oral cavity, we need to make sure that the patient can actually open their mouth. They don't suffer from trismus or lockjaw. Uh, this, more often than not, is a reason that people have difficulty swallowing as well, more than people will actually think. So if you can't get a good look into the mouth, then there's not much point doing the oral examination. Consent is everything. Always important whenever you do any sort of physical examination on a patient. You need to wear gloves and remember your hand hygiene. Just because it's the oral cavity and it's filthy doesn't mean an immunocompromised patient can't get an infection from your filthy hands. Another thing that is vital in an oral examination is a good light source. Now I've spent many years looking for tools, uh, anything that makes my life a little bit easier in the job that I do. And the best light source that I found for clinical purposes is actually one that's not marketed for clinical purposes at all, and it's the O-Pen. So a mate of mine opened a shop and I got the O-Pen from there. And it's one of those ones that has different illuminations in it. So it ranges from five lumen, which is perfect for your perla, any eye examination. But then you have options to go 20, 60, and 120 lumen. Now, 20 and 60 lumen is optimal for having a look in the oral cavity. And 120 lumen, well, that shouldn't really go anywhere near patients, but it's good for just general use. The pen itself is also hard cased and black, which I love. Uh, so for what it's worth, whilst I'm not sponsored by O-Pen or anything like that, sometimes using the old pen torches and that sort of thing to look in someone's oral cavity is less than optimal and you want to carry equipment that is robust and has multiple use. So if you're looking for a good pen and a good clinical light source, then I recommend having a look at the O-Pen series itself. Other things that can make it examination easier is having a tongue depressor. You don't always need them, but sometimes it helps out. When you start your physical examination, always start externally to the mouth and then work your way in. So have a look at all the areas of the face, look for any lesions. Lesions are quite common around the mouth, especially in the corners of the mouth, and look for facial asymmetry. If you have asymmetry, then it can indicate that you've got swelling on one side, either from the glands or salivary glands that we'll look at. It's also a good idea to palpate the cervical lymph nodes. Uh, and the neck itself to find any referred pain and things like that. Now I'm going to do a lesser on lymphadenopathy, but as part of the oral exam, it's a good idea to have a complementary lymphadenopathy examination as well. A common source of pain associated with the mouth is the TMJ. So you can palpate that, which basically sits just in front of the ear. You can put your hand over that and get the patient to move their jaw in a series of angles and movements uh, to look for any clicking uh, and discomfort. Another idea, if you like, is you can actually place your finger in the ear on the TMJ joint, and if it's hard of hearing and you want to listen for crepitus, is you can stick a stethoscope over the temporal region and get the patient to move their jaw around, listening for crepitus itself. Another thing that often gets overlooked when conducting an oral or throat exam is the salivary glands. So whilst there are multiple small salivary glands all over the mucosa and oral cavity, there's really three large areas that basically form on either side 
of the face. So your parotid glands are the largest of all of these and they sit outside the cavity, uh, just superior to the angle of the mandible. And the parotid duct emerges from the second molar. So you can actually have a look in the second molar and you can even palpate and milk the parotid gland to see uh, saliva coming out, especially if you think there's an actual salivary gland infection. You've got a submandibular gland, which is the majority of all the glands in the submandibular area. If it's enlarged, it can be mistaken for a lymph node itself. As to can the sublingual gland that sits underneath uh, the chin, that can often get mistaken for a lymph node itself. So just be aware. Physically look for swelling and really only palpate if you need to. It can be difficult, but if you notice any gross swelling around these regions, then it's always best to refer. Other things you can look at around that area before going into the oral cavity is having a look at someone's lips and gums. So ask the patient to open their mouth and use your torch uh, to inspect the patient's lips. Uh, look for any colour change, inflammation and ulceration itself. So when you're shining the torts around lips, if you're using anything over five lumen, just make sure the patient closes their eyes in order to protect uh, the area. Another common place to look is around the teeth and the gingiva itself. So gingiva should be discolored. Uh, it should be pink at the top and then a little bit wider below. But if you have any discoloration, then it can be a sign of gingivitis or even periodontitis itself. Moving into the oral cavity, but not to the throat just yet, we can have a look at somebody's tongue. So ask the patient to stick their tongue out and move it from side to side to observe for any swelling or obstruction or even difficulty moving. Now, if there's any abnormal movement in the tongue, then you need to perform a cranial nerve examination itself. Now, there's a lot of uh, interest in the tongue, even associated with Chinese reflexology and things like that. And there's plenty of studies that have tried to prove and disprove this reflexology. So if you're interested, have a read. But the first examination of the tongue within the oral cavity can confirm the presence of all three types of papillae. So check carefully for the usual size and the coat of the tongue. So the coat is best evaluated uh, in the first two thirds of the tongue. Once it gets to the back, it's usually quite red and there's not a lot of coat back there because it gets a lot of movement in the back of the throat. Most references are made about the tongue coat uh, being associated with dehydration or illness, things like that. Uh, one proper interpretation in literature uh, is the formation of this coat is caused by the dying stratified squamous cells that becomes hydrated and then white. So basically they're the outer layer of the cells that are plump full of moisture, they turn white and they haven't actually fallen off yet. Now the thickness of the coat is largely dependent on the balance between the rate that the squamous cells are being produced and the rate which the dead ones are actually being worn away. And what wears these away is things like eating and talking. So if you have a disease, you're feeling sick, then you're actually not eating and talking that much, which increases the coat, which makes people have that connection with somebody feeling sick. But it can also be if you have a disease that interferes with the proliferation of these cells or the hydration of these cells, then you can also get a thick coat. Its connection with dehydration is associated with the fact that dehydration will dry up your salivary glands and therefore decrease the amount of sloughing that these epithelial cells happen. So it's not an absolute indication of dehydration, but it can be a contributing sign. Looking around the buccal mucosa, cavity floor and hard palate, uh, you can use a tongue depressor to move the tongue out of the way if you want to have a look at the mucosa. If the patient can't move their tongue off their oral cavity, the tongue ratio is, is, is just off. You can ask the patient to lift their tongue to the roof of their mouth so you can have a look at the oral cavity floor. And then you can tilt their head to the side to have a look at the hard palate as well. So you can find things like ulcerations around the actual buccal mucosa. White patches are 
somewhat common. You often get uh, white lines associated with rough teeth or people biting the side of their face, that sort of thing. But it also can be infiltration of, of leukocytes and obviously you can't eat a when you're looking at the cavity floor, you can look for something known as a sublandigular duck stone, which is basically a salivary stone uh, that forms in the duck and can block it and therefore gets quite painful. So the saliva actually helps to build up a plaque on the teeth. Because it's quite an alkalizing substance, the minerals will harden, causing this plaque formation on the teeth. So mineral formations can form in the ducks themselves causing them to get blocked. Okay, lastly, we'll move to the oropharynx itself. So ask the patient to say the good old classic R, and this will naturally cause the depression of the tongue in your examination. Now, if they're saying of R doesn't actually flatten the tongue, that's when your tongue depression comes in, and you can gently press the tongue down, not too far back, stick to the first two thirds of the tongue to prevent anyone with a very sensitive gag reflex from gagging on you. When you're looking in the oropharynx, position the torch to get a good view. Again, if you're using the bright lights, make sure the patient closes their eyes just in case. And have a look at areas known as the palatoglossal and posterior palatopharyngeal areas. And look for those arches. Now, the pharyngeal tonsils will actually sit in the tonsillar depression in between these folds okay that look like the, the, the arches now inflammation of the pharyngeal floor and the uvula uh, is an indication of your pharyngitis but pharyngitis may also present with that uvula swelling as well other causes of swelling include injury and acid reflux itself if there is any nearby palatine swelling such as the presence of a peritonsillar abscess which is known as quinsy then the uvula will actually be pushed to one side and cause a basically a deviation of the uvula. Now, if that happens in the presence of an abscess, then it's quinsy. If that deviation occurs in the absence of an abscess, then we start looking at that glossal phalangeal nerve lesion probability and we do a cranial nerve exam. In most healthy individuals, the tonsils are difficult to see. A chronic bilateral enlarged tonsils uh, is usually benign. So if someone always has large tonsils, then it's usually not a problem. It's just the actual tonsillar tissue has gone through hypertrophy, that sort of thing. But a cause of a unilateral tonsillar enlargement uh, can be quite sinister, including carcinomas. So pharyngitis classically can spread to tonsillitis. The swelling is, in this case, is often bilateral and usually one tonsil is a little bit bigger than the other. If there's white exudate, uh, then it can be an indication of bacterial involvement, however, not solely, and the use of the Centaur criteria is recommended. Now, if the person's had a tonsillectomy, then you can see white granulating tissue uh, in the tonsil of bed that some people mistake for actual pus itself okay that ends the lesson on the throat and oral examination i hope you got something out of it just something to add to your arsenal to think about when conducting a physical examination based on your subjective questioning but until next time take care